hills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. It's still dark and early, the spotlights are out, the animals haven't even awoken yet, and this is Safari Live. Ready. Standing by. Good morning everybody, welcome to our not so sunrise safari because we had a bit of rain last night and it's still quite cloudy. Now my name is Taylor and on camera with me on this lovely chilly morning is Craig as he sits quietly in the back just trying to keep warm this morning. Now I hope that you're all ready for an action packed sunrise safari let's keep our fingers crossed those thoughts positive and hope that the royal family are going to make their return because that is what Craig and I are looking for this morning as we're coming down to check their regular f spots that we often find them in now if you have just tuned in and you're not hundred percent sure what Safari Live is all about we are a live interactive safari so what you are watching is happening right now it is I'll tell you exactly what the time is in South Africa 30 one minutes past five in the morning here in, on uh, well, the northeast corner of South Africa in the Kruger National Park and if you have any questions for us please do send them through you can hashtag Safari Live on Twitter with your favorite pictures of the day or in just any questions that you've got to you more than welcome to of course send those through and Craig says he's very cold and he didn't bring enough jerseys today so I think our next town trip Craig we're gonna have to get you a blankie for winter so we can wrap him up nicely maybe a nice maybe a pink dressing gown will be good for Craig I think that will keep you warm my mum always loves a dressing gown she says there's nothing warmer and then I'll even get you a hot water bottle Craig that you can stuff down the front which will then keep you nice and toasty <laughs> he's not saying anything he's just giving me a glare from behind the camera now <laughs> But we're gonna get towards uh, Twin Downs. We're actually not too far away from there And we're still using the spotlights. It's of course very very dark with uh, the little bit of rain We had last night it lasted a whole of five minutes I suppose it's just like leaving the sprinklers on for a little bit and just giving the grass a little water Which they haven't had for about two weeks. So I'm sure that they will all the vegetation out here will enjoy that little sprinkle we got Not enough though I wish we'd had even more. Right, let's have a look here and see what's happening on this very cloudy day. I feel like today we could have be very, very lucky. Let's hope that the, well, the butterflies that I've got in my stomach are true. And we're going to keep on searching around here, checking for tracks, checking up in the trees, and we'll check Hosanna's favorite little pan. But there's still well, two more people that you need to meet this morning. Steph is not quite up just yet for bushwalk, but Tristan is ready, rearing to go, and he can't wait to say hello. Indeed, good morning everybody. My name is Tristan, and on the back of the camera is VM, the incredible. And we are looking around for any signs of the Birmingham's this morning. So we've come to check this western boundary. Yes, last night when I was with the Nkuhumas, I had a report that their Birmingham's were coming east. So we're in this area and we are rearing to find some male lines. That would be nice, wouldn't it, Viam? I reckon three male lines would be great. So hopefully we shall find some sort of sign of them. They have been a little bit elusive of late. They often seem to be cutting this little corner um, right in the northwest and then go into Biffle's Hook but maybe we'll get lucky today and they'll be with us and I hope Taylor is successful with her mission on the Royals as well because they have been quite absent the last few weeks I haven't actually seen any of them I don't think in maybe 12 days which is quite a long period normally for them they at least make a show here and there and Karula if not the, the Cubs, Karula is often doing patrols and we catch her. So it would be really, really nice to see her. And 
this morning is a good opportunity to actually find her because that little bit of rain that Taylor was talking about has probably smoothed things out a little bit and you can also then tell the freshness of track so if Karula has walked somewhere and it's on top of the rain then it will be really quite well not easy but a lot easier to track her down and hopefully find her so hopefully Taylor will have luck and then if we have no luck with the Birmingham's on this western front and I think what we're gonna do is we're going to do a little boundary patrol and just see if we can pick up any signs of Karula and the Cubs coming in and see if we can help Taylor out a little bit and give her a direction as to where they maybe have gone or if there's just any other leopard around it would be nice maybe to find Tingana again I haven't seen Tingana for a while so it would be good to see him and I wonder how Shadow's faring now that I'm actually driving this western area yesterday she managed to make a kill so on Sima Mili, so hopefully she's still got it and was not robbed by the marauding hyenas that occupy that space. See the... But wasn't it amazing to have a little bit of rain last night, Vim? Nice just to settle the dust a little bit. Didn't last very long though, Vim, when I were talking about it. It was heavy, but it was all of about 10 seconds, I would imagine, and then it was all gone. So it hasn't really wet the ground too much. It'll just stopped a bit of dust coming up this morning which is always good and I suppose every drop counts it's all adding to the water table Steph and I were actually talking about it last night um, at the dinner table we were chatting about the water table and how high it is and that when you're in the Mulawati there's still quite a few active seeps going on and when you drive you can hear the water underneath the tires as you drive through the sand so still quite a bit of water around which is great so it's good news and hopefully it shall last the winter right now I believe Taylor is still busy with her tracking and looking around so let's go close to 30 and see how she's doing and whether or not she's managed to find prince for the royal family Well, Tristan, we are searching and we are searching hard, I can tell you that. We passed Twin Dams and there was nothing there but a very shy hippopotamus who we'll hopefully have a look at a little bit later. However, we've driven up towards Leadwood. I just wanted to come and check down here to see if there were any tracks. But our only problem is now is because that downpour that we had was quite early this morning and it was at about half past two. Hang on, I just need to check these tracks very quickly. And uh, anything that walked prior to that footprints are not going to be around anymore. No, hyenas. Because that rain, even though it was quite short, it was quite heavy though. So it's enough to just sort of clean the roads. The sand is all wet on the roads. So it's a bit difficult. So we're going to go back. I just want to check a small section of Garimain. I just want to check into until Shibamu to see if they haven't popped out somewhere. But I haven't seen anything just yet. So hopefully... We will get lucky and we will spot something. So let's go on a little search. But this section of Gauri Main is not great. I, I mean, it's it's so hard and compact and I keep seeing half sort of trodden on footprints, but it's just hyena tracks that the rain has sort of messed up a little bit, which can be quite tricky when you're looking at them, especially from the car. Let's just check here. They're like baboon pan. No. And there's no birds alarming either. None of that shouting going on just yet, which is very useful to us. We actually love it when the animals alarm because it helps us locate the different predators. But not this morning, not just yet. This is their favorite areas. They often are here. And you know Karula, she is so sneaky in her old age. She's wise. She just knows when to avoid the vehicles and I suppose she needs a bit of a break too. So we just take this at this as that celebrity has now gone on a holiday and she's had to keep it a big secret otherwise the paparazzi follow her around, which is true. That's definitely true. We follow her everywhere she goes. So, Karula, your four day holiday is now over. You better be uh, back at work otherwise we're gonna, she's, well she'll be issued with her as, she, as she's absconding from work and that's not on, can't be doing that. I mean, that's absolutely ridiculous. 
So let's see if we can find something. See, now the sand is nice and thick and soft over here. So even if the rain uh, did cover her track, she'd still be able to see an indentation in the ground. It wasn't heavy enough to completely wipe away these thicker areas. But we're not having much luck. There's nothing here. Just a couple of elephants that were walking through last night. Let's check. We'll probably go the pan, Shibamo pans. We'll check around quickly, check around treehouse. And then if we don't find anything that side, then I'm going to go up Leadwood and go towards, uh, um, what's it called now? Uh, Nyala Road, north and south. And we'll check there as well as Drakensburg, Mamba, which is another spot that she likes to go into sort of those blocks and not come out of them. Very sneaky cat. Check here. Weaver's nest, no tracks, none at all. I also wouldn't mind seeing some hyena today. That would be nice. That would be very, very nice. Craig, you didn't tell me what you wanted to see, but you've had much time to think about it. Craig would like to see a squirrel today. Craig, we will show you, try and find a squirrel for you to film. How exciting is that? So we'll do squirrel day two and see how many we can see. And then hopefully we'll get all the things on our list for this morning. And this is the part of safari <coughs> when you do come out is that you do have to spend a bit of time tracking animals. They're not always so easily posed out onto a tree or a termite mound or in the same spot that you left them the day before. Most of the time it's actually hard work and you do spend a bit of time driving around and searching and it's so important to track. Right, let's check here. We're coming up to Shibamo soon. Still nothing. The roads are crystal clear today. Everybody's obviously been walking through the grass, which I don't know why they'd want to do that because you get so old. I suppose it doesn't really matter because they probably all got wet anyway from the downpour. So a bit of dew and now lots of rain on the grass won't really do them too much bother. Oh, nope, <laughs> I can't believe it. There's like there's a couple of hyena tracks. Normally these roads are littered, absolutely littered with activities from the night. I think this is the first time I've ever seen the road so quiet. Right, so it seems as though Tristan and I are playing a game of hide and seek with the animals this morning and hopefully we'll be able to track something down but let's go across to him and see how his venture is going. Well indeed Taylor and I think the animals are winning at this stage. They are hiding and we are seeking but no luck just yet. I'm looking all over on Buffalo's Hook boundary just to see if there's any sign of any animals moving around. The only tracks that I've found so far are tracks of a male elephant that was walking around this morning. He also left a nice big pile of his droppings as well that seem quite fresh. But just having a look, and Vim and I reckon that maybe we're going to get a bit more rain if we have a look up onto this eastern horizon, which is often where the rain comes from. You can see it looks a little bit more ominous, doesn't it? There's quite a dark cloud in that far eastern section. So I think we might be in for a bit more rain, Vim. I reckon you have called it spot on, so we shall have to watch that. And hopefully that will mean good news for us in terms of the leopard front. I don't know why, sometimes on these cloudy mornings, leopards do come out and we do get to see them. Now the other good thing is that it is a very dark morning, which means that some of our nocturnal animals might still be lurking around. It's on mornings like this that I've had a couple of my pangolin sightings and also I've even bumped into an aardvark at it in the morning like this, sometimes even civets, so it's also a good time to look out for them. So we shall keep a keen eye for those rarer nocturnal animals as well as we go before it gets too light. Now, unfortunately, no sign of the Birmingham's coming in. They must still be around Elephant Plains, Simambili area. I wonder if maybe they didn't join up with the Inkahumas last night and are somewhere on Arethusa. Might have to keep a little ear out for that, see if they all join together. It'd be nice to see the three boys with all the Inkahumas and, and the cubs. That would be a nice surprise. But 
alas nothing coming onto Juma that I have seen in this northwest side and nothing going into Buffalzook or coming from Buffalzook at this stage. Now it's yesterday at this time we would have been spotlights off already we would have been able to see what was going on quite clearly but this morning is a little bit more dark and dingy so I was still using the spotlight but I think we can put that away now it's a little light enough that I can actually see what's going on now the thing about this weather is that it's if the wind gets up which it often does when you have a storm approaching then it's not going to be ideal for elephants and buffalo and those big herbivorous animals. They don't like the wind at all. So as soon as the wind starts to whip up, it interferes with their hearing and their sense of smell and generally just is quite miserable. So you find that they tend to go into more thicker, denser areas. So it's not going to be ideal if we get lots of wind. But if there's no wind, then it always is quite nice in these conditions. of the animals are far more active because it's not hot so they're not seeking out shade they are transitioning between areas and they are quite happy to walk right out in the open so hopefully it will mean good luck for us even though it's been a slow start to the morning and that Taylor and I are not achieving goals just yet but patience is a virtue and with patience comes good things so we shall just keep checking and scouring and seeing what we can find. I think this is actually the first time I've driven Buffalo's boundary and not seen a leopard track. Generally it's like a highway up here for leopards and you find multiple different male tracks up here, sometimes even female tracks. So it's quite surprising that we actually haven't seen any at this stage. Now we might have a little bit of picture breakup. I'm just going through a bit of a dip. It's sometimes Wendy in these dips is not ideal she has a little meltdown when we go through some of the dips so if there is a bit of picture breakup I do apologize it's normally not too bad here it's the next dip that we come to so before we get there and before we have too many technical glitches and gremlins let's go across to Taylor and see whether her hide and seek game is going better than ours Tristan, I'm apparently not very good at hide and seek because I have yet to find anything. I haven't even found my first bird for the morning yet. Uh, I think with this cooler weather that's sprung upon us, everyone's uh, gone into a bit of a shell shock and decided to hide away. But you were obviously chatting with Tristan and talking about the senses of the animals and how they're affected in weather like this. And I'm really hoping we're going to get lions or leopards on the move today because after the rain most of the scent is washed away so they need to come out and remark territories. So it is indefinitely a good day to see a leopard or perhaps a male lion. You never know but it's now also getting a little bit light. The spotlight is not doing what it can do very well so I've put it down for the moment. But still not one footprint. Let's see if we can get a bird that's not going to fly away from us. Maybe we'll get lucky and we'll have to start with something small and work our way up to something a little bit bigger. But it is really very, very quiet. Turtle doves, where are you? Where are you when I need you, turtle doves? Can you believe this? You can hear the birds. Very difficult though, they're just starting to wake up now. Maybe that's why, maybe it's because they haven't quite woken up yet with the, the delay of the light because of all the clouds. And it's also Sunday. Oh, Craig, what are we even doing out this morning? The animals don't work on a Sunday. Craig's nodding his head and then he's agreeing. Not saying much though. <laughs> oh, there's a bird. Hang on, let me go forward. No! Oh, are you kidding me? Come back here in the tall spur file. There's a spur file and I'm going to show you. Now Matthew, you're wondering about elephants and if they're early risers. They don't really sleep much. They only need a couple of hours of sleep every single day. Sometimes not even. This bird, you, are not going to be in my good books. 
There's, okay, so there's quite a few different birds here. Let's have a look at the crested Franklins. And then there's also a Natal Franklin, but it's a uh, spur file, but it has now run away. That was the one that was sitting miserably on the road. But here is mom and dad, crested Franklin with all the little babies. Well, they're not actually tiny anymore. They're not so small like the ones we saw yesterday. They are much larger. They're juveniles now and are probably a few weeks old already. But isn't that cool? A little happy family. Can't even count them. One. I'm trying to count the chicks. I think I saw about four chicks here. And they can have quite a few. But sadly not all of them will make it to adulthood. Just because there's so many different things that would like to eat them. But very cautious. You can see constantly almost standing up on their tippy toes to see over the long grass looking at us. Making sure we're not making any sudden moves. And at least they have now settled down and we're able to look at something. Wonderful. Thank you, birds. Let's hope that my luck has now changed. So we've done Gauri Main. We have done uh, Shibamo. We checked the pans. Absolutely nothing there. And we then passed Treehouse Dam again. Nothing there. So now we're going down Weaver's Nest. We'll keep those lights on for a little bit. And um, from here, well, we're going to slowly start making our way back towards Ledwood and where we will drive around over there for a little bit and hopefully we get lucky. I really, really, really hope we find a spotted cat today. It's been ages since we have last seen one. Or Tingana would be nice. Any any of the spotted cats would be fun. Cheats Brothers, that'd be okay too. I'd settle for them. We're so greedy, aren't we, Craig? Being out in the bush, being spoiled with all the wonderful sightings of the various animals that we sit here and we almost demand things. You just sort of snap, snap our fingers, right? Come on out. And you forget that some days are really easy and really good. And uh, other days, well, not so easy like it seems today. And I actually always found that on safari. Uh, there were very few days where your day would start and it would just absolutely start buzzing. From the moment you drove out of the lodge right to the end of the lodge, it was action-packed. They do happen, those drives are definitely there, but they're very rare. They're not, they're not quite so common as, as what everybody ex thinks. So it helps with us because we've got lots of different vehicles out and different feeds coming out so we can show you more things than just one car. But it's either the first hour and a half of the morning that you just have everything, all the animals, or it's the second hour and a half of the morning, and uh, the last sort of bit that everything sort of comes out, wakes out, and then starts showing themselves. I actually quite enjoy it when it's a bit of a lull first thing, and it builds up, and, and always to see your guest face thinking, oh, you know, I, sh I should have slept in, I should have chosen this morning to skip a safari and sleep in. And then next minute, like wild dogs will come running across the road, or a lion will be charging after a buffalo. And it's always an, an amazing surprise on their faces that, you know, that sort of really, that wow of wow, you never really know what's going to pop around the next corner. So that's what I actually quite enjoyed a bit. And I hope that you always like things like that. But if you do have any questions for us, as Tristan and I search desperately for any animals, please send them through, anything that you'd like to chat about. Hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. It's the best way to get hold of us. Okay, let's go back on to Gauri Main again. Let's just check this road for a second time. Go past Twin Dams. Have a look. Oh, hang on. Look who's just popped out now. I can hear the ox peckers and I turned my head because they got my attention. Good morning. Where have you been hiding out? Some giraffe. So that's amazing. So what actually caught my attention is that if you listen very carefully, you'll hear the ox peckers. And you can actually see them flying away. Now they're not talking so much. But there were indeed a couple jumping between the two giraffe that I can see. I think there's more here. They're all just hiding in the long bushes. But hungry, hungry giraffe eating the thorniest of thorny trees with their amazing long tongues. And look how they do it with ease as well. That tongue is so strong. It's so robust. It's not quite as sensitive as our tongue. But you see it when the animals are still young. 
If you've ever watched anything, a kudu, a giraffe, an elephant, you'll notice when they m use their mouths, or if you're an elephant, you start to use their trunks. At that very young age, they struggle. You'll see that they're picking, trying to not touch the thorns. You'll see when one thorn hooks onto it and it pulls back very quickly. And it takes quite a bit of time for that tongue to start becoming robust. It's the same thing with the tip of an elephant's trunk. It's obviously soft and new skin in the beginning. And then if you're a gardener and you work in the garden, you'll know straight away that after a couple of weeks working without gloves, holding your shears and digging around with a fork, you'll know how calloused your hands become. It's not necessarily the most attractive thing, but it's useful because it means that you can then grab the rose by the stem without really having to put gloves or anything on and it's much easier to use and that's exactly what happens with the animals is that I think that they got a, they're, they're used to it and then they also have a higher pain tolerance I think we, we as humans unfortunately do not have the greatest pain threshold but there they are, feeding away that one's now eating on an acacia Elite, you said that it's such a long tongue. You're quite correct, but they need it, though. At the moment, it doesn't look like they need it at all because they're not even feeding on the highest trees. They're actually feeding at a much lower level, you can see there. And that's just because there's an abundance of food around. But as winter comes and the animals feast upon all the favorable things, like all the sweet grasses and the sweetest of sweet leaves, then often only, well, the other not so sweet leaves are left and that means that the giraffe has got to stretch its head up all the way to the top almost stand on the tip of its hooves let it send its tongue straight out to the top of its mouth curl around some leaves and pull them back down into their mouth so at the moment they don't need to do that you're seeing they're just sort of picking around occasionally using their tongue and wrapping it around the plant and pulling back and stripping the stem from the leaves which is one of the most effective ways to feed and they can do that with the acacias even with those big white thorns because they're actually quite flexible especially if you find a new shoot on a tree those, the, those thorns will still be green, they're not going to be hard at all and very easy. Wrap your tongue around, pull back, get all those nice juicy leaves off. But they're moving off now into the thicket, so let's carry on. Thank you, giraffe. There we go, so we've done, we've done bird, which is great. We've done crested franklins, we've done giraffe. We're getting there, we're getting better. Hopefully we're going to next move on to a predator, seen as though we've ca covered uh, um, the aves family. We've now uh, uh, done, well, some herbivores. I think it's time for some carnivores. So I can starting to see a couple of vehicles. We've also got a bit of a drizzle going on. We may have to put rain covers on. I'm not sure just yet. Steph has finally awoken. He's done his tricks. He's checks. He's pulled his socks up. Let's go and greet the bushwalk team. <laughs> As you can see, I've pulled my socks up. <laughs> Good morning. And uh, yes, it's Steph and Winterboer on bushwalk this morning. And we're with Dave this morning on camera. And it's one of those awesome days that the hot weather over the last couple of days has been heralding. It rained. Half past two this morning, it came down like a bucket on top of my roof, which is very pleasing to hear, but worrying. I was worried about everything, you know, cars and electronics and all that sort of thing. But it didn't seem to do any damage at all. Just took the dust out of the air, gave us a nice gloomy start to this morning and has brought in with it a wind with a little bit of moisture, which is quite nice. So I don't think the, the, the weather report doesn't say that we're going to get much rain today. Just a little bit of a spattering and then it sort of clears up for the rest of the week, unfortunately. Um, so I don't know, we're celebrating it today. The fact that it's one of the very last of the gloomy days before summertime is finished. And we go into our dry season, our winter time with massive blue skies, not a cloud in the sky. And of course, it's just drying up and drying up even more. I don't quite know. You know, in midsummer, you always miss those cold winter days. In midwinter, you always miss these these thickly uh, humid summer mornings. So I don't quite know what to say at the moment about it. I quite like it. I think I'm gonna, this year, I'm gonna sit and rejoice in the fact, breathe in all the smells and enjoy the, the actual summer for a change. Now, Natural Bull, you wanted to know if there's any flowers or you'd like to see any flowers that bloom after rain. Natural Bull, there's no flowers that bloom after rain here, unfortunately. They are all sort of just flowers that have their season. So in the beginning of the season, there are some flowers that, that 
come out after the first rains but it's their time of the year that's the time of the year that those particular flowers like to bloom and as we go deeper into summer the flowers that bloom December and then January and then February and finally the even flowers that bloom after uh, our wet season into into the winter time we get all the aloes blooming we get all our euphorbias blooming so in every single month here yeah, there will be a flower that is blooming right now we have a lot of the blue haze flowers the Els the evolvus elsinoides that is blooming at the moment it's got nothing to do with the weather it's got everything to do with how much rain has fallen and how much sunlight there is uh, at this particular time of the year so what I'll do is throughout the course of the show, I'll show you the flowers that are blooming right now, if you like. Um, and uh, we can have a look at them. So there are a couple that are just specific to this time of the year. And uh, throughout the next couple of hours, what I'll do is I'll point them out just for you. As for a direction we're walking in today, I literally just picked the nose into the wind the default position which for this year has happened to be south almost every single day we're heading south out of the camp oh we've got a baboon there i think this is mr james henry's friend come and have a look he's the one that's been raiding our camp it's a lone bull baboon that's what you call a baboon oh no there's a couple more baboons not too much not too many just two. I think these are the two that have been raiding the camp. Let's go around this tree and go and see. So this baboon has been literally sitting in our, in our, uh, in a tree above our entrance to our camp, terrifying everybody. There he goes over there, terrifying everybody because he's been sitting two or three yards above our heads, uh, picking off the buffalo thorns. Hasn't got a fear in the world about us. Look at that one over there, sitting on that thin branch. There's a couple of them here, I think we're in the middle of it. William, you've commented on the fact that if it's very humid, would scent travel less far? Um, yes, I actually think so, William, to be honest. Uh, uh, humidity gives, gives the air a lot of moisture. Obviously, sound travels quite well in moisture. Um, but quite often thick humidity is associated with no wind and you're going to need wind blowing any particular direction to to really carry sounds to you so um, humidity w won't have too much of an effect on a still day towards sound um, but I definitely think that that wind plays an important factor obviously from one direction so yes under certain circumstances um, sound will travel less far uh, than it would be if it were with wind. I find personally that wind from any particular direction carries sound a lot easier than just a still day. Um, all right, let's carry on going. It's amazing. I leave camp and within the first 20 steps, hay fever slams me in the face. And that's because a lot of the grasses at the moment are busy giving off massive amounts of pollen and I know Jamie and Tristan are suffering terribly from hay fever and I don't really get hay fever much but the pollen is so overwhelming at the moment that even I am starting to suffer uh, most of these mornings at the moment <laughs> so please excuse me if it sounds like I've got foot and mouth disease but uh, my skull seems like it wants to drain itself of all the fluid that I have and it's just because of your body's reaction to just massive amounts of pollen. What it does do though is it gives the air around here such an awesome smell. And so of course the hay fever is, uh, is welcomed when it comes with such a nice smell. Alright, we're going to send you over to Taylor for an update. And as soon as I know more about what I'm going to be doing today, I'll let you know. So Steph, I'm not so sure about the pollen in the air because Tristan and I at the moment have been sneezing left, right and centre. It uh, hasn't been fun and it's sort of been in, well, an informal competition between the two of us who has the reddest eyes after game drive and who has sneezed the most. <laughs> and every time anybody that I know watches the Safari Live, the first thing they say to me is, oh you sneeze a lot and I'm like, yeah. 
obviously I'm sneezing a lot if you see all the grass and sand and dust and stuff that is out here it's an absolute nightmare but hello birdies well spotted by Craig a pair of bachelor eagles beautifully posed on a dead knob thorn no it doesn't look like much because the sky is so grey very very dark and cloudy as we've all been chatting about and the clouds are moving quite quickly now as the wind picks up and you can see that the wind has definitely picked up as the birds feathers ruffle <laughs> which is quite funny and I'm sure that they're sitting up nice and high the highest spot so that they can dry their feathers out as I'm sure they would have got a little bit damp last night oh, that one just pulled out an old feather that's not necessary well not needed anymore it's now also almost choking on it come on spit it out you can't eat your own feathers and of course it's not trying to eat its own feathers it's just stuck to the tip of its bill which is unfortunate let's see if it's going to use its foot use your foot to take it out or use your friend's foot you can do that too now this is most likely a male and female they both look like adults they've got the brown patch on the neck the white barring on the sides of the wings the red facial plumage and the red legs oh and now they're going to preen each other and this is another thing that would definitely say to me that this is a male and female because they are monogamous and they're constantly working on strengthening the bond between the two and of course well grooming or preening as it is in with, with birds is one of the easiest ways now it's difficult to actually tell you which one is <clears throat> male versus which one is female typically the females are bigger so I reckon it may be the female that's, that is receiving the grooming because the one on the right, the one closest to us, looks just a little bit smaller. Not by much, but just a little bit. Actually, Craig, can I, I'm going to reposition very quickly. What I want to do is I want to try and get them both face on. So if we go around the corner a little bit, we may get a better view. So let's carry on. Let's go around here. Ah oh, yes, this is going to be better. This is actually going to be very nice. There we go, Craig. Now we can see. Now you can actually see the size difference slightly. Now, natural, you're wondering how my bird list is going. It's actually going quite well. I don't think we've added Batelier to the list yet. I shall get my mobile out. Seeing as though I'm, I'm making the list on my phone, I've actually got to add a couple more that I haven't put on here. Um, it, it's not going, I mean I've actually have stopped, not stopped doing the challenge because I keep adding every time we see a, a new bird but I also have been a little bit slack but perhaps now well this gloomy morning is bizarrely often the best days to do a birding maybe we shall try and do some but have a little listen as the dawn chorus is only waking up at 8 minutes past 6 they're very late so have a little listen lots of turtle doves going at the moment there's a couple of robins and here a laughing dove me slapping my face as a fly sits on it this is actually all I can hear at the moment is just the turtle dove and the laughing doves goodness gracious they are dominating today and typically you hear a, a good all round of birds but one bird that you don't actually hear very often is is the raptors and the bateliers as well. You don't, they don't normally call when they call when they're in flight and it's actually quite an amazing thing to see. Look at that. That is actually really sweet. Grooming through all the feathers there. Using that sharp hook to actually help. So when they call they'll be flying around and they sort of, it sounds like a squawk. Wah! Wah! They remind me of the turkeys of the sky or the chickens of the sky. They've got a weird call. But as they do that, they drop their legs too. And uh, it's, quite, it's quite something to see. I can't quite describe it very well this morning, but uh, hopefully we'll be able to see it one day. Maybe this, uh, this morning or this uh, sunset safari, and then we'll be able to go through it and have a look. But very attentive as well, even the birds constantly looking over their shoulders because there are bigger raptors out in the bush too. 
Not that they'd receive too much trouble, I don't think. Oh my goodness, Craig, we have an emergency on our hands. We have to get a quarry branch because I'm going to lose my mind with these flies today. They are everywhere and they won't stop flying into my face. And I just am not quick enough with my hands to try and get them. See, not. Great, right, let's go. Because they're biting. They feel like they're getting down my shirt and biting me too. So we'll have to go away. And we need to find something. Right, I just need to very quickly grab a branch here. I'm not winning today. Just warn them that I'm coming in. Okay, now I've got this. Now Sabre Beautiful, you were wondering where the nest was of, uh, of those birds. Craig, are they bothering you? So you must let me know and then I'll have a good, good whipping at the flies. Sorry, say beautiful. These flies are a nightmare today. I don't know who they think they are. Very rude of them. Just keep swatting as we drive. So I'm not sure if they have a nest at the moment. It's a bit late uh, to be breeding at this time of the year. We've actually been seeing a lot of juveniles out and about. So the juveniles are brown in color. They look very much like the adult, adults, but they don't have uh, the red facial plumage, or, um, facial plumage, facial skin, or red skin on their legs yet. It's normally a grayish blue color, and, and then they also, like I said, they're almost a chocolatey brown, and they don't have the white paneling underneath the wings just yet either. And that can take a number of years before they reach that age. So I haven't actually found a battlier nest before. That's one of the few nests that I haven't been able to spot, but we'll keep it an eye out. This pair lives around here. We often see them when we come onto Leadwood. It's not the first time we've actually put them up on screen. And if you remember, I think it was at the end of last year, we had that amazing sighting where the Batelier and uh, sitting with the moon directly above it. And I'm pretty sure it was one of those Bateliers because it was around here too. And they can be quite territorial. They'll sort of have a little area that they uh, live in. Right, let's keep swatting. Now the rain is spitting. It's not too bad just yet. But there's a couple of really dark clouds that are coming in now and if it gets any harder than the spit we'll have to stop and put some rain covers on. Ah, let's keep going. So we're going to keep searching around here and hope that we're going to find something as this miserable wind picks up. Now Tristan has managed to locate the biggest mammal so far this morning. Let's go see how he's coping in the wind. Well it is starting to gust and we've also been rained on. You can see the dark clouds that are shifting past us very very quickly and so VM and I got a little bit wet but it's stopped raining now and we have managed to find a small little group of elephants tucked into a thicket. Now earlier I was talking about the elephants and in the wind and how when it's windy they don't really like to be out in the open. So now that that wind's gotten up they really are tucked in the deepest bush and you can see it's it's quite dense in there but it'll be perfect for them because that'll all be blocking the wind and it'll be making it much easier for them to be able to hear what's going on as well as pick up scent. So you'll find that this is where the elephants will be it is amazing how dark it is though. It is very, very dark this morning. It's not much light out there at all. And the other thing that's quite incredible is how fast these clouds are moving. You can see there that they are blustering in and moving very, very quickly. So this must be the edge of a front that is hitting us. So I would imagine that we're going in for a dark, gloomy morning. Vim, what do you think? Indeed, a gloomy day, Fiam says. But it's interesting, it looks like a very small... In fact, it only looks like a mother and her calf. That's all that I can see currently. The calf is off a little bit to the left, but it's not really visible. Just every now and then see an ear flicking. But other than that, it's just this female that seems to be on a raised platform there. So maybe on a termite mound and is busy feeding off termite mound elephants love to do it so do rhino and buffalo and you'll find them often on termite mounds feeding and the reason why is because a lot of these termites 
when they build their mound, they build it out of their feces and their saliva and particles of soil. So it's basically like mixing compost into the soil. And so the grasses that grow there tend to be far more nutritious than anywhere else. And so for an elephant or especially elephants actually with their very poor digestive systems they're getting the maximum amount of nutrients for the minimum amount of effort and that's why they often spend time on these mounds oh, there we go now we're trying to negotiate our way down ah Sarah funny enough I was actually thinking about these this morning you're know, asking whether the marula fruit is available to the animals in the winter it isn't, I'm afraid. And in fact, all the marula fruits are now gone. I haven't seen a marula fruit this week. I've been looking under all the marula trees and I can't see anything. And you can see just like that, there goes our elephant. And so bang, they're off into the thickets and deep dark thickets. But to continue on our marula fruit, um, they only really fruit February is their normal month for them. So sometimes a little bit into March if we get late rains, but generally only really February. So now the marula fruits are finished. There won't be any more until next year. So the elephants would have made hay while the sunshine and they would have eaten masses of them. But now they've got to turn to other areas to find food as well as all the other animals. So unfortunately for them, no more delectable marulas. All right. Now. It is dark and it is dingy and it's not very pleasant out here. But Steph has a blooming flower to bright. Thank you, Tristan. And Naturable, this is just for you. This is uh, this is the hibiscus, one of the one of the one of the few hibiscus. We don't have a lot of hibiscus flowers that actually occur here. But this is one of them, and you're looking at that beautiful yellow color. Also, incidentally, happens to be Rebecca's favorite color. So, Rebecca, please rejoice with Naturable here. This flower is dedicated to both of you. Um, lovely red maroon color on the inside. It's a bit of an angry plant, though. It got quite cross with me and stuck one of its spines into my finger. And you can see on the actual stem that the plant itself is protecting the flowers from being eaten at least by insects crawling up the stem from the ground. So although it won't be able to do much against flying insects, it can absolutely protect itself from being either climbed up or eaten as a plant because that stem has got these quite vicious thorns on. You can see those very fine, the wind is blowing, so excuse the plant blowing in the wind, but you can see those very fine hairs and spines. They are intensely sharp. Pieces of fiberglass is what I'd like to, uh, you know, uh, compare it to probably. That, that entire length of that spike went into my finger and I can now feel it underneath my skin burning a little bit. So that is just this plant's mechanism of saying, I um, don't taste very good. And, uh, and uh, please don't come and eat me. And uh, natural... It's a pleasure. Um, I'm glad that you like it. We'll find some others for you today as well, so don't go anywhere. We've, uh, we've got a long morning still ahead of us. That is actually quite incredible, these little spines. You know, how the plants develop these things? Obviously, it's through millennia of, of trial and error until some mutation works in the plant's favor. And in this particular case, it's these glass-like spines that are incredibly sharp. I actually wouldn't be able to touch this plant. I'd be able to touch the flower, but I wouldn't be able to touch the plant without spiking myself somewhere again. So well done, plant. Pretty, but with some spikes. Reminds me of my wife. <laughs> All right. <laughs> We are on Philemon's Dip Road and uh, we are making our way through to Shibamu. That's where I feel like walking today. Um, for one reason and one reason only. And that is the beehive that is there. Excuse me, uh, Megan, please won't you just repeat that question? I know, James, you've just asked me a question. I'm just going to get it repeated to me. The wind is blowing in my ear. Ah. James, you wanted to know, are there types of trees that hold scent marking better? Please excuse me there. With ears the size of mine, when the wind is blowing, it feels like an orchestra going off in my head. Um, 
James, you wanted to know if, if there are certain trees that hold scent marking better than others over here. Hmm, that's a good question there, James. I suppose a tree that protects the underside of the leaf from the elements would be better at, uh, at holding scent. So for instance, let's use this tree right here as an example. This is one of the bush willows, this big tree here. If a leopard or a lion had to come up to this tree and scent mark, obviously they're lifting their tail and they're scent marking up into the bush, this tree would be able to offer a lot more protection than say grass would because the urine would stick to the underside of the leaf which A is protected from the sun because of just the nature of the leaf but B also by dust and wind and rain for instance wouldn't be able to wash the scent off. So I would imagine that trees with larger leaves a little bit higher off the ground, not too high, a little bit higher off the ground to stop the grass from waving against it would have a much better ability to hold scent. And I wouldn't be surprised uh, if over the next couple of years you would if you could uh, identify the trees that you see leopard and lion scent marking, that you will probably find that they would choose to scent mark specific trees for specific reasons. I don't think that they would be consciously choosing those trees. What I do think it is, is as that leopard lives in that territory, certain trees will hold their scent more than others. And those are the trees that they're going to go back to, to re-scent mark again. So they will be drawn to scent marking posts, for lack of a better word, rather than uh, just randomly. They still will randomly scent mark, but you'll find that the greater majority of the scent marking will happen on specific trees. And if you do a species list, I would be surprised if it topped five different species um, of trees that you would regularly see, say Tingana, or regularly see Karula from, uh, from scent marking. I, I would be quite surprised. But that's an interesting question there, James. Got me thinking this morning. Too early to start thinking this morning. The coffee hasn't even really hit my veins yet, James. But <laughs> thank you. Um, so, the idea for today is to go to Shibamu Road for one reason only, and that is for the beehive that's there. I want to go and have a look and see if this particular beehive that I know is there has a detending fly. There's a type of fly over here that hatches its eggs, its maggots, live in its body. So just think about this. This fly, then the maggots come out of the fly's body and hold on to their mom. So here you've got a maggot holding on to the mom. The mom then sits at the entrance to a beehive and as a bee comes into the beehive, the mom takes off and inverts herself and lightly touches the bee with her abdomen. The baby then climbs off of the mom, climbs onto the, onto the bee, eats its way into the bee's body, and then goes and lives inside the bee, sucking all its juices, and eventually it kills the bee. The bee then drops down dead on the floor, spins around a little bit for a couple of minutes, and then the maggot emerges out of the bee, climbs into the sand, pupates, becomes a fly, comes out of the sand and flies away. How's that for a horror story? that I've, I don't know, I've been thinking about it since I read it a couple of weeks back. And uh, I only know of one beehive here on uh, Juma, shown to me by a honey guide a couple of months ago. And I'm going to go straight back there now. I want to go and see if we can see this particular fly and see if we can show you this particular fly. And uh, that's my plan. So we'll probably get sidetracked as always, it always happens. Don't forget, you can send us questions as you've seen today. You can send us questions using the hashtag Safari Love and I am smelling a must bull. Here we go. So look what's happened over here. So as I crossed over this particular, this particular patch got a very, very pungent smell. And if you look here, you can see the grass has been trampled and been trampled off in that direction. There was a herd of elephant that passed here. And one of the elephant that was following this herd was a bull elephant in must. Now we've all seen, well, not we've all, so let me rephrase that. Some of us who've watched for a long time have seen big bull elephant that have this secretion coming from their penile sheath. It's from their prostate gland and it absolutely smells. Some find it quite pleasant. I find it to be an overwhelmingly sick, a sweet a uh, cloying smell that sort of gets into the back of your nasal passage and sticks there. Um, 
but he's walked off here. Now, this happened last night. It's fairly fresh. Let me see if I can see his tracks here. But it happened before the rain because it's been washed out pretty much. But So we've had a whole bunch of Ellie's pass here. One of them's in mass. It does mean that we're going to need to be a little bit more vigilant. It doesn't mean we need to run away in the opposite direction. But mass bull elephant are a worry here. They... Uh, they have about a 70% increase in their testosterone levels, and that makes them a bit edgy, for lack of a better word. All right, we're going to send you over to Taylor for an update, and you're going to give us some time to put a rain cover on our camera before we break it. Right, still swatting away at the flies as you can see and absolutely no luck with the leopards unfortunately. I do not think that they are here. I think that they have snuck off of the property and gone somewhere else. Which is slightly frustrating but I suppose it's just one of those things and that's what happens out here in the wilderness. So I was listening, um, not listening, I bumped into one of the Chitwa guards and he'd said that, hang on, actually I don't know if we're going to get through here, but we will give it a bash. The Malwati is still quite, no, it looks alright. And um, they'd said that Ngahumas late last night actually took down a young Inyana bull and ate it um, quite late into the safari, I think after we'd already shut down which is quite exciting. However, I don't have a roof on and I don't think that I should take a gamble right now with this weather possibly turning um, because we don't want to get stuck out in, of course, very heavy rain with all this very expensive equipment and now it is coming down. Now the rain is really, well, let's have a look at the starling if it's going to sit here and maybe you'll be able to see the rain droplets. <laughs> can hear him calling. <laughs> getting all excited in the rain now. You can see that this virtual starling's colors are not quite shining as nicely as they normally do when the sunlight hits them. And you can see all the rain drops as well as I pack my books away, put them under cover. We don't want them to get wet. But look at it. They don't seem to not mind the, the rain so much. Obviously they do enjoy it. I think they become nice and clean. Though this one is now heading down into the thicker vegetation where it'll be slightly more sheltered. Though, Birdie, I think you should choose a tree that's got leaves on. That will perhaps provide a little bit more attention and off it goes. Not attention. Oh my goodness, look at this weather. We're going to have to go back to camp to get a roof. It is now pouring with rain. We are getting soaked. Hey, Craig. We're going to have to start heading back to camp as well. So we're going to try and, ooh, hopefully this rain comes now as we turn around the corner. I have to put my hood on, otherwise it's going to be a disaster. But um, we haven't got any rain. Craig, you don't even have a rain jacket on, do you? No, we're going to get so wet. So it's pouring down. Actually, I want to show you a mud wallow and you can see the water as it is hitting the ground. It's quite a bit of rain. Here we go. Can you see that? Lots and lots of dribbles. Roof time. I can't believe it. I will, I'm actually kind of happy. I'm actually quite happy about the fact that it is raining, of course, because we do need it. So I'm not going to complain about that. So we need to zip back to camp uh, to put a roof on. I'm going to send you across to Steph and I wonder how waterproof he's made himself. We've made ourselves waterproof by hiding away at the pump house in Philemon's dip. <laughs> so, so, there we go. We've hidden David away so that his camera doesn't get too wet. We've got our raincoats on and things like that, so we should be okay. We're able to at least um, come to you from here. So, I think what's going to happen is we're going to start doing a few plants and things <laughs> while we get ourselves all waterproof. I literally just said, oh, don't worry, this rain is, gonna, this rain is going to... Um, this rain is going to go away and as I said that it started raining. Incidentally, this is what the rain cover looks like for the camera. This is what David has to make do with. It's quite a fancy rain cover actually to be quite honest with you. There it is over there. It's our new one as well. So you can see 
The only problem with it, of course, is that it's not on, which is half the issue. <laughs> which is why we've had to seek refuge inside the Philemon's dip pump house. Um, not too much of an issue. I'll use it at the moment to cover my radio pack, or I'll just turn around and face in the opposite direction. Or So, no, it's coming down in a bucket at the moment. It's one of those fun days where we're just sort of uh, enjoying the rain. Now, Crystal, you wanted to know how many invasive plants we have in, uh, in South Africa. Um, that's a good question, Crystal. I'm not 100% uh, up to date with exactly the list of, of invasive plants that we have. Um, there is a list that is, uh, that is generated by our Department of the Environment, and it's substantial. The Department of Environment has a, has, or the Ministry of the Environment has a department in it specifically for the control and the eradication of alien and invasive plants and it's a very well resourced uh, department in this country uh, headed up by uh, a numerous uh, uh, well-known scientists and um, they spend a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of effort eradicating invasive plants mainly because of the effect that they have on our water. South Africa is a water poor country and of course a lot of the alien invasive species of plant suck up massive amounts of water um, and also pose a threat to humans. Not only just to crops, uh, South Africa has also got uh, a very high level of, of poverty and of unemployment. A lot of people live subsistence farming and what happens to land that, we, that, that, that you can't farm is, of course, it has an effect on people's ability to feed themselves in these, in these, uh, in these countries like South Africa, where people live by feeding themselves. And so it's a very important thing for South Africa to control alien invasive species. As to exactly the, the right amount, I'm not sure as I'm standing right here right now. There are lists on it, though. Um, and so, yes, you will be able to find it if, if, if or I will be able to find it, or, you know, I invite you to have a look for it. And then uh, what you could do is, uh, is um, basically go and look for it if you really want to. Now, um, Mike, you have asked me a question, are there certain types of bees and or certain types of flowers that bees like to collect pollen from? Um, Mike, that's a good question. No, I, I think that there's enough stratification amongst the bee species. Uh, in other words, there's enough different sizes of bees that they would be able to work with the pollen from almost every single flower. And of course, the ability to, to provide uh, pollen or to use pollen is one of, the, uh, one of the defining characteristics of flowering plants. And um, as these flowering plants have evolved, so the insects that pollinate them have evolved. And I would imagine that, uh, that you know, we get from the tiny little Mopani bees all the way through to the big carpenter bees um, that they'd be able to, to use any range of flowers. So I think, Mike, I think every flower that produces pollen will probably have a bee species associated to it of some form or another. And um, yeah, basically there is that. The rain seems to be coming in these waves now. What it is going to mean, yeah, here we go, here's another rainy, well, here's another wave of rain. I'm just turning towards you so I can get my radio out of the, the, the water. Jandre will be very cross with me if I break it. And uh, we've still got Dave hiding underneath his roof. <laughs> He's got this little sliver of roof that you can see here. It's probably about a foot wide. <laughs> and he... <clears throat> So, Philemon's dip pump house coming into its own, which is quite nice. Now, um, I see we are being collected by Mr. Alex Voz right now, so that we can go and get our tent sorted out. And uh, what we'll do is, um, is get the tent ready, so that we can, do, we can carry on with the show. And, uh, and of course, we'll be doing it from the tent, so that we can, uh, we can weather the storm, so to say. And uh, Tristan and Taylor will have all their rain covers on. Ah. Here we go. It's now blown off a little bit, which is good. I can wipe my brow clean. <laughs> Get some of the water off my head. <laughs> now, James Richard, you've just made a comment about a World Flower Day that's going to happen. Be oh, World Frog Day, excuse me. World Frog Day that happens on Monday. Um, yes, the rain will definitely help fill up these little bits of p the little pans where we're hoping to do uh, World Frog Day will bring World Frog Day to you from. Um, this time of the year, end of summer though, uh, 
frogs of uh, the, the pans are having their frog moments so every pan has like a frog crescendo and then it'll happen for a few nights and then that pan will die down as all the female frogs in that area's eggs are fertilized and the next pan will start they don't all happen at the same time mainly because males need to get from one pan to another they can't just get there simultaneously and, and all over and so you'll start to see male frogs start calling in females at different times and each pan has their different things so Basically what happens is you need to figure out which pan is starting on its up, on its, on its upslope uh, and that's where it's going to be, the, that's where the activity hive is going to be or hub is going to be for the next couple of days. Right, so what we're going to quickly do is, um, what we're quickly going to do is send you over to the dam cam so that we can get ourselves uh, prepped with the tent and uh, Tristan and Taylor are almost finished putting on their, uh, their rain roof, so we're quickly going to be sending you over there to the dam cam. You'll come back with Tristan and Taylor or myself from the tent, and that's where we'll get you in the next couple of minutes. Don't go anywhere else. just almost finished putting on his rain covers and uh, well myself and Craig have indeed put our roof covers on but my name is Taylor and Ta uh, Steph is setting up the tent and hopefully he'll have that sorted in a moment but this weather has really just come out of absolutely nowhere we obviously had that little downpour in the early hours of the morning and then it was clear sky we could see the stars when we started prepping the cars uh, early this morning for, for game drive which was quite amazing it was lovely and I thought okay this is gonna be a great day it's gonna clear up it's gonna be sunny well I was wrong about that and you can see as I turn the car that the Impala are also not so impressed this morning look at them all sheltering themselves with those big worry shrubs it's amazing they're all standing and looking one direction and that's just because they've tried to tuck their bums underneath the quarry trees and keep away from the rain so it doesn't necessarily mean that they've got to stand underneath the shrub it's just that they've got to have well the other side of the tree facing the rain and the wind and then they stay nice and cool and dry all the adults standing up ruminating all the little ones sitting down in the long grass trying to stay cold or nice and warm you see they're not quite used to the the variations in in weather as the adults are they've had a couple of years of experiencing the hot and then freezing cold and then pouring with rain and then hot and and so on and so on <laughs> the little ones have still got to get used to that and this is where it's actually quite dangerous for the youngsters because they can die of cold shock so it's not too bad now but if all of a sudden we get this cold spell and it continues into the night there is definitely a possibility that some of the youngsters won't come out of it but that of course is just one of those things it's nature and only the strongest genes will survive. Now remember, we are on a live safari, so if you have any questions for us, hashtag safari live. That is the best way to get hold of us if you've got any questions. Right, let's continue. Let's see what else we can find. The rain is now, well, taken a break. Let's see if we can go, let's see if we can get into reverse first. Yes, there we go. And now the wind has picked up. But I don't think it's over. I think that there's going to be a second wave of clouds, of uh, nimbus stratus clouds that pull through and then pour over the top of us. So hopefully we'll be able to find something to have a look at. I'm just trying to see, let's go down towards Impala Plains. Let's go this way. It doesn't look like anybody has driven here this morning. So we shall be the first and we will go and investigate. Right. 
Now it's going to be very difficult for you to help me search this morning as the camera has to be pointed forward because we've got Craig zipped up and the cozy back of the of the car now. It's, it's so dark in there I can't even see Craig anymore only when he smiles and he shows his pearly whites. That's the only giveaway that he's still alive and kicking. Let's see. I don't know if we're going to see any, any, any more elephants. Getting very, very windy now. So now this is going to be a real challenge, of course, is trying to find animals in this weather. Earlier this morning it was still alright. It was not so bad. The wind wasn't too strong. However, it's picked up quite a bit. Craig, are you holding down? He's holding down one of the canvas <laughs> that is now flapping. And it, it sort of sounds a bit like Christmas in the car with all the zips sort of ch chiming against one another. It's quite pleasant. Off we go. Maybe we'll see some land snails, some African land snails after this bit of rain, perhaps a slug. Who knows? It would be quite nice. I don't know, Craig, if we're going to see the squirrels today. I suspect that the squirrels will be hiding away in their little burrows and their oh, the holes in the trees. And what else did we say we wanted to see, Craig? The spotted animal. Maybe. Come on, there's some elephant tracks here and some dung. Let's see if we go around towards Triple M. Maybe we find something. It actually looked like it was on top of the rain. It didn't look too old at all. Stick my head around outside of the canvas to check down there. No, nothing. Mm, let's see. <laughs> the birds have even gone away now. They're miserable. They're hiding away. There's another car here. I don't want to disturb them. See, there's a bird, but we're not going to be able to get it because it is actually, oh my gosh, it's a black shouldered car. No ways! No ways! Craig, I don't know, can you see it? I think it's too high. Ah. Let's see if it comes around. There's a black shouldered kite flying around. Okay. Well, well, we'll just have to take my word for it, I'm afraid. Very cool, very, very cool bird. I haven't seen one. The last time I saw one was in Kruger and it caught a dove, which was quite amazing. Oh, it's a pity you can't see because the way that they hover is just unbelievable. Remember, the black shouldered kites and the pied kingfishers are our only true hovering bird species. The other birds, the sunbirds and the raptors, they use the wind to help aid uh, them with hovering. But that's actually quite a nice one and I'm so sorry we can't show you the roof. It restricts our views of the birds and it is flying quite high in the sky. And, and of course it's quite, it's moving. I don't, and it doesn't look like it's going to perch itself again. I think it's on the hunt for a rodent or even a dove. They catch lots of birds too. They're exceptionally good flyers. Tig's head, you're wondering if any animals suffer from frozen shock. They do. Uh, cold shock is quite common, especially amongst young animals. So uh, we, we typically see it with impala. Impala, I think, in this area suffer quite a bit. Uh, if you go down towards Kalahari, you'll get the smaller antelope like springbok, also suffering from something along those lines. Uh, so th there are definitely a number of different animals. This weather's not quite cold enough just yet. There's definitely a, a drastic temperature change from yesterday, but it's it's not freezing. I mean, I, I'm not I'm not particularly cold. I'm I'm quite snug now, and even with my other coat on, it wasn't waterproof. I was also still quite quite snug, and I'm pretty sure those jackets that I had on were the equivalent, maybe even not as good as the the coat of an impala. But remember, they're able to. Uh, perform something called phyloerection where they erect all the hair on their bodies and in between uh, that little air pocket that is created that all warms up and essentially it's like an electric blanket and I'm, I'm pretty certain that they're much warmer than what we are. They didn't look too cold today they were just I think they were just damp so I saw a couple of them shaking all of the water off of their bodies and then going to stand back with their bottoms against the against the, the gory trees. My goodness, there's so much thatching grass growing around here. 
All right, let's go have a look. I don't know what we're gonna go and do. We're just gonna, I think we're just gonna bumble until we spot something. We did a loop there, no elephants. Let's go this way around. Go around here until we get something. That was so cool. I'd love to see that black shouldered kite again. I'm really, really nice. We used to see them a lot down in the Eastern Cape. And um, maybe we get lucky and that one hangs around for this afternoon. We'll try again when we don't have uh, the roof on. It seems as though Steph is now ready and waiting in the tent. So let's go and see if he's managed to dry himself off after, well, his bushwalk. <laughs> 